Thank you for joining me as I begin my examination of The Defense of the Faith by Cornelius Van Til from My Atheist Perspective. In this video, I'm going to be covering the introduction and the first chapter of the book, but before I get into that, I'm going to sort of reintroduce the premise, the format of the series, and talk a little bit about what I'm going to do and why I'm going to do it. So if you're watching this and you are a veteran of these series of mine and you would like to just skip all of the preliminaries and get right into my consideration of the text, you can skip ahead to the time code on your screen and you can just bypass all these uh, introductory remarks of mine. Um, for those of you who decide to stick around for that, this is my attempt to offer a response to the kind of arguments that atheists are often presented with by Christians that they might converse with online, maybe converse is too kind of a word, uh, or that they might be confronted with by Christian relatives uh, who might see their atheism or their agnosticism or whatever form of non-belief they espouse as just a phase that they need to be turned away from. Uh, I know in my life as an atheist, mostly online, but occasionally in real life, I've had the experience of encountering usually a, a, a good intentioned Christian friend or acquaintance trying to sort of argue me out of being an atheist. And it can really help to have a handle on the arguments and not only to know what you think and be able to articulate your position, but also to understand their arguments and understand why they believe what they believe. And uh, this series is my attempt to do both of those things, to present my side of things, to respond to what I read in these books and explain why I don't believe what the, the, the authors are presenting in the hopes that people watching this could maybe take my arguments as a starting point to help them better articulate their own positions. And also so that I can understand the arguments that Christians, in this case, uh, are making for their position and against mine. And up to this point, all of my books that I have reviewed in this series have been popular apologetics books, books like The Case for Christ, or I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, or God's Not Dead, oh, oh, that was a rough one, uh, or The Works of Ray Comfort, there's another one that kind of gives me a little bit of a, like, you know, hearing a door creak, like in a horror movie, it's, you know, you hear a, a kind of whistling sound that you're not quite sure where it comes from, and it makes you feel kind of spooky, that's Ray Comfort. And, and Bryce Brooks to me. Um, but uh, this book that I'm going to do for this series is my first attempt at doing a somewhat serious text. Uh, Cornelius Van Til was a theologian. He was a professor at uh, Westminster Seminary, and he was not really writing for a wide audience. He was writing for a more academic audience. He was writing for his colleagues and for students, people who were more seriously engaged with theology and apologetics. So this is not necessarily a book that is very likely to be placed in your hands uh, as an atheist. It's a bit heavy for that. But many of the arguments that it describes are the kind of arguments that are found in those other more popular texts and that many of us have encountered as we engage with Christian folks and we have these conversations and arguments that if you're watching this video and you're an atheist, or even if you're a Christian, you're probably interested in having. Um, Van Til was a Calvinist and he was a presuppositionalist and his thought is very influential uh, when it comes to modern day Christian presuppositionalists. And Van Til himself was not an ancient writer. He, he was a 20th century writer. Uh, this book that I'm about to read was first published in 1955. Um, and his, his thought is very influential in shaping how presuppositionalists approach apologetics and approach arguing with non-believers about Christianity and attempting to persuade people into becoming uh, Christians. Now, Van Til himself uh, had one big idea that has sort of survived him, and that idea is called the Kuiper-Warfield synthesis. And this is the idea in which Van Til combines two approaches to uh, engaging with non-believers. The first approach was uh, propagated, was originated by the theologian Abraham Kuiper, and uh, that is the notion that Christians and non-Christians uh, 
uh, begin their considerations with different presuppositions. And uh, then there's also the notion held by uh, the theologian B.B. Warfield, hence the name Kuiper Warfield Synthesis, that uh, rational proof for Christianity was possible and that rational arguments could convert unbelievers with the help of the Holy Spirit. So the Kuiper Warfield Synthesis is Van Til's way of fusing these two ideas and saying, yes, Christians and non-Christians begin with different presuppositions, but even though they start with different presuppositions, there is still an effective method for rationally proving the truth of the Christian faith, and there can be effective arguments that can convert non-believers to Christianity, even though they begin with different presuppositions. So, this is Van Til's attempt at what you might call a third way to think about engaging with non-Christians. Um, and his attempt to bridge that gap, his attempt at that third way, basically comes down to his version of the transcendental argument, which again, if you have engaged with presuppositionalists on the internet for any length of time, you have heard the transcendental argument. And even if you haven't heard it called the transcendental argument or the tag argument, uh, you have probably heard the argument itself, or you have heard apologetics from people that have relied on the transcendental argument for the, their basis. And uh, I'm sure that we'll get into it as we get further into the series. Very generally speaking, the transcendental argument uh, in its logical form is uh, without God, knowledge is not possible. Knowledge is possible, therefore God exists. That's the very simple presentation of the transcendental argument. But we'll get into that in more detail as we go through the book, I'm sure. Now, uh, Van Til, of course, as I said, he was a, a teacher at Westminster Seminary. He was an author of many books and pamphlets, including A Christian Theory of Knowledge, The Case for Calvinism, Why I Believe in God, and this book, the book that we're going to be considering in this series, The Defense of the Faith, which was originally published in 1955. I will be working from the fourth edition of the book, which was published in 2008 and which is edited and annotated by K. Scott Oliphant. And I will refer occasionally to Oliphant's footnotes because they are present throughout the text and some of them are extremely helpful in understanding Van Til and providing context for his remarks and, and, and his thoughts. So, the book itself is divided into two parts. This series will cover uh, multiple chapters per episode for the first part of the book where the chapters are a bit shorter. And then when we get to the second part of the book, uh, the series will then move to covering one chapter per episode because the chapters get a little longer in the second part. Uh, and overall, this series will run a total of 10 episodes. So, let's get started with the introduction. Van Til begins by defining his position which he calls the Reformed faith, which is also commonly called Calvinism. He notes that his Reformed position is distinguished from Arminianism, uh, so-called after its primary originator, Jacobus Arminius. The main point of disagreement between Calvinists and Arminians is regarding the doctrine of predestination. Calvinists believe that salvation, which is also referred to as election, the saved are called the elect, uh, is predestined, and it is completely up to God who is elected, and it is unconditional. That is, election is not based on anything about the individual to be saved. God chooses you to be elected for his own reasons entirely, it has nothing to do with you or anything you've done or anything about who you are. Um, Arminians, on the other hand, believe that salvation is conditional, on the faith of the individual. They still believe in a form of predestination, but they believe that God saves those who he foresees will have sufficient faith. So in a sense, it is still somewhat up to us whether or not we get saved. Uh, and Calvinists do not deny the significance of faith, but they see faith as being a gift from God. Faith is something that God grants you. It's a result of having been elected for salvation. And uh, for Arminians, it's just the other way around. Your faith is what earns you your salvation, not a result of your salvation. Uh, Calvinists view other key characteristics 
of a Christian's relationship to God in this same way. They hold to a doctrine of total depravity. That is, that man's fallen sinful condition is complete. It is absolute, which means that man, humans, uh, are completely incapable of saving themselves, of choosing salvation, because everything we do is tarred by our sinful nature. Um, so not just faith, but also repentance and conversion are not things that we do necessarily from our own uh, motivation, from our own actions. These are things that are granted to us by God. God grants us repentance. God grants us conversion to Christianity. And God grants us ultimately salvation. And these things are irresistible. If God chooses you, then you're chosen and there's nothing to change that. And that, that is how the Calvinists uh, view salvation and, and things like that. Van Til also specifies that the Bible is infallible and his highest standard and that the Reformed confessions and the writings of Reformed theologians like the aforementioned Kuiper and Warfield and of course John Calvin are his secondary standards. So the Bible is first and then the, the great eminent uh, Calvinist theologians are right beneath that and also the confessions which define the doctrines of Reformed churches. Um, and by the way, the specific Reformed confessions that Van Til is talking about, because there are many, actually, uh, are what are known as the three forms of unity. And the three forms of unity are three documents called uh, the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of Dort that originated in the 16th and 17th centuries that define the official doctrines of the Reformed Church, or at least of the version of the Reformed Church of which Van Til considered himself to be a member. Next, Van Til summarizes objections to his views raised by his fellow Calvinists, namely William Masselink, Cecil de Boer, Jesse de Boer, Clifton Orlebeek, Franklin von Halsema, and James Don. For our purposes, you don't need to know who any of these people are. The main point is that they all disagree with Van Til about stuff that only Christian theologians could possibly give a shit about. Much of the disagreement that those critics uh, have over Van, with Van Til is over Van Til's view of the concept of common grace. And common grace is a doctrine which holds that God has a generally favorable disposition toward humanity. Uh, even the unsaved, even people who are not saved are still generally thought of in a good way by God, according to common grace. And Van Til's critics all have problems with how he views God's common grace being received by humanity. Some accuse him of supporting idealism and existentialism, which are fighting words to a Calvinist theologian. Uh, Van Til, on the other hand, insists that his views are based on Calvin and on Reformed traditions and, uh, of course, the infallible word of God. So Van Til doesn't see himself as innovating or changing anything. He sees his views as just a natural continuation of how Calvinists have always thought and always done things. The purpose of this book then is for Van Til to answer those critics and he'll do that in two parts as I mentioned. The first part uh, we will begin in a moment with chapter one and that is a summary of his theology and then the second part consists of more direct responses to the main points of criticism. This essentially is an argument over how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. I think we should recognize that if, if you're a fellow atheist of mine watching this at the, on, at the outset. If you are not a Christian, much less a Calvinist, the dispute between Van Til and others is probably of no real importance to you. I know I certainly don't give a shit. Uh, but in responding to his critics in this book, Van Til details his theology, which has been extremely influential to many Christians. If you've ever found yourself pulling out your hair while engaged in an endless, pointless argument with a presuppositionalist, and brother, have I been there, then you can blame at least part of that on Cornelius Van Til. So hopefully hearing, understanding, and as best as I'm able, responding to Van Til's theology will be of some use to me and to those of you watching as well. We'll see. And if, if you are a student of theology, if you know more about this subject than I do, I am sure my responses may feel superficial or naive at times, 
Uh, but as I said, my intention is to offer a response from my perspective, uh, both to help me understand and also hopefully to give other people watching who may encounter these arguments at least a sense of what a response might sound like and a starting point for their own thought. So let's get started with chapter one. Of course, this is uh, part one, which is titled The Structure of My Thought, and chapter one is titled Christian Theology. Van Til begins this chapter by insisting that he doesn't mean to create a new form of theology. He sees himself as a teacher of apologetics, and his theology is that of the Reformed Church. What makes Van Til special, mentioned in the editor's footnotes, is that he based his apologetics on his theology rather than on broader philosophical arguments for the existence of God. So while Van Til's basic views on Christianity might not be all that different from other Calvinists, particularly other Calvinists who have not thought about it with the same amount of depth as a Calvinist professor or theologian, the methodology of Van Til sets his apologetics apart from others and again has been very, very influential. Van Til's approach to apologetics begins by defining what Christians are to believe and defend. He argues that one can't defend Christianity as a, historical relig as a historical religion unless one is also able to defend it philosophically. To Van Til, these two things are inseparable. The historical defense of Christianity requires a philosophical defense of Christianity because a non-Christian can easily deny that, say, the resurrection ever took place. And even if the non-Christian grants that the resurrection did take place, uh, the non-Christian can then say, well, the resurrection may have happened, but it doesn't necessarily have any significance beyond being an unusual event. Uh, and I know that non-believers can do this because I've done it. That's, that's one of my responses to claims about the resurrection. Even if I grant that it happened, it doesn't automatically follow that everything Jesus said was true. Now, I might suggest that this wouldn't be a problem having to make a philosophical case in order to make the historical case if God had seen fit to provide us with a more persuasive and enduring body of evidence that the fantastic events depicted in the Bible, like the resurrection, actually happened. But I suppose his ways are not our ways. Only by appealing to reason which cannot be waved off by the non-believer, can Christians truly defend Christianity as a historical religion. Van Til says, quote, But to engage in philosophical discussion does not mean that we begin without scripture. We do not first defend theism philosophically by an appeal to reason and experience in order after that to turn to scripture for our knowledge and defense of Christianity. We get our theism as well as our Christianity from the Bible. Indeed, scripture is central to Van Til's apologetics. I would argue that he bases his apologetics entirely on the Bible because the Bible is all he has. The historical evidence for the really important bits of the Bible, the bits that would prove Christianity to be inarguably true, could they be substantiated, is virtually non-existent. So Van Til bets everything on his only shot. If he can prove that the Bible is, as he says, authoritative on everything of which it speaks, and also incidentally that his particular interpretation of the Bible is the necessarily correct one, then he wins. Now, unlike many of the apologists who followed him, Van Til doesn't simply take it for granted that his interpretation of the Bible is the necessarily correct one. He spends the rest of this chapter discussing why the Reformed position is the correct one, that is, the biblically correct one. He organizes his discussion under six subjects. The doctrine of God, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of salvation, and the doctrine of the last things. So to start with, the doctrine of God. Van Til describes God as possessing both incommunicable and communicable attributes. The incommunicable attributes are those which are totally unique to God, of which humans can never partake, and the communicable attributes are those which can be passed on to humans. 
Van Til lists four incommunicable attributes of God, and they are God's independence, that is, God's existence is dependent on nothing else, there is no source for God, he is totally sufficient unto himself, immutability, God does not and cannot change, infinity, and this is both in terms of time and space, God is eternal and also omnipresent in the universe, and unity, which means both that there is one God and also that God is uh, simple. He is not composed of parts that existed prior to his existence as God. He is a single unified whole. The three communicable attributes of God mentioned are spirituality, invisibility, and omniscience. And those three are fairly self-explanatory. But I do have a question that Van Til doesn't really address. By listing omniscience as a communicable attribute, is he saying that humans can be made omniscient? If so, I wonder why this would be one of, why this would be the only one of God's omni attributes to which we might have access ourselves. And it turns out, as we get a bit later into this chapter, that's not what Van Til is saying, but it is a bit confusing. I think it's more likely that Van Til isn't talking about omniscience being communicable in the sense that humans will be able to literally know everything, uh, but more in the sense that we can know some of what God knows in the way that God knows it. Van Til elaborates on the attribute of omniscience, saying that God knows things without having to examine or interpret them. God's knowledge of facts is what makes them facts. Now, we're not there yet, but this is a very important point when we come to presuppositionalism, which relies on God being able to reveal things to us such that we can be absolutely certain of them. And again, Van Til doesn't clarify this point, but I have to assume that if he says omniscience is a communicable attribute of God, this is the sense in which he means that God can communicate that to us. Not that we can become omniscient in the comprehensive way that God is, but that God can share with us certain bits of knowledge that we can know for certain as God knows them in his omniscience. Now, Van Til discusses two more aspects of God. First, there is the personality of God. The Reformed doctrine of God's personality, as clarified in the editor's footnotes, states that God has a mind, a consciousness, and a will. In other words, he is a person. And it is from God's personality that concepts like truth, beauty, and goodness originate. Van Til calls these concepts identical with God's being. In other words, God isn't good because he meets some standard above or apart from himself. Goodness is one of his attributes. Now this, again as noted in the very useful editor's footnotes, amounts to Van Til's solution to the Euthyphro dilemma. Now I find it one of the most telling things about religion, and Christianity in particular, that it presumes to definitively answer philosophical questions that aren't really meant to have definitive answers. As I understand it, the Euthyphro dilemma points out a paradox in the concept of a benevolent God. If God loves the good because it is good, then there must be a standard of good apart from God, which means there is something higher than God, which most Christians would reject. But if that which is good is good because God says so, then that renders good an arbitrary concept. It's not good because it's really good. It's good because God says that it's good. And this concept of good also throws into question other attributes of God. For example, how can we say that God is truly just if there is no standard of justice by which we can judge God's actions to determine whether or not they are just? If that which is just is only just because God decrees it to be so, then how can this concept of justice have any meaning? Most people would object to the suggestion that justice is that which is pleasing to the person with the most power, but that is what justice is reduced to if we accept the second possible answer, or what is, what is called the second horn of the Euthyphro dilemma. Anyway, I think 
that it's supposed to be an unsolvable dilemma, the Euthyphro question. That's the point of it. People have tried to solve it for centuries. People have argued about it, explored its implications. But then along comes someone like Van Til, who sweeps all of that aside and says, nope, good is good because God says so. As if that just definitively settles the question. And if you ask him how he came to that conclusion, and why you should come to the same conclusion, he smacks you in the face with a Bible. Rhetorically speaking, of course. Next, we have the Trinity. Van Til holds that God is a triune personality, and that the three persons of the Trinity are co-substantial, that is, none is derived from the others, and none is greater than the others. Nothing too earth-shattering there. That's pretty typical Protestant Christian thought. From the doctrine of God, we move on to the doctrine of man. This is the next most important doctrine when considering apologetics, since apologetics deals with the relationship of God to man. The doctrine of man is considered under three subheadings. The image of God in man, man's relation to the universe, and the fall of man. First, the image of God in man. When the Bible tells us that man was made in God's image, Van Til says it means that humans are as like God as it is possible for us to be. We are limited creatures, but we are made to be as like God as it is possible for limited creatures such as us to be. It also means that humans were originally created with the true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness of God. And then we lost those things due to the fall. Uh, but despite these likenesses, Van Til emphasizes that man is necessarily different from God. Those incommunicable attributes of God can never be a part of our being. No matter what happens to us, we can never be those incommunicable things that God is. We can never be immutable. We can never be infinite, etc. Quote, God's being and knowledge are absolutely comprehensive. Such knowledge is too wonderful for man. He cannot attain unto it. Neither could man ever expect to attain comprehensive knowledge in the future. We cannot expect to have comprehensive knowledge even in heaven. So to hear him talk like that, it sounds like omniscience is not a communicable trait, but he has already said that it is a communicable attribute. So again, I feel certain that he must be talking about what I described earlier. Uh, that we can't have comprehensive knowledge, but we can know certain things for certain. Next, man's relation to the universe. As originally created, man was meant to interpret the world, dedicate it to God, and rule over it for God. That is Van Til's perception of man's relation to the universe. Van Til does not elaborate on this point really at all. Perhaps he assumes, probably correctly, that the Christian critics he means to answer with this book all have a view of man's place in the universe that is just as conceited as his own. Finally, the fall of man. Van Til sees the sin of Adam and Eve as a total rejection of God, an attempt to find truth and goodness without respect to God. This also led, Van Til says, to a false ideal of knowledge, the notion that man could have knowledge without God. And when man realized after a time that knowledge without God was impossible, man blamed his circumstances and his finite nature rather than his rebellion against God. Now it's important to note that here Van Til is speaking of knowledge in the sense of absolute unquestionable certainty about something. This is how presuppositionalists talk of knowledge, and they typically reject all other senses of the word. Uh, he's also falling back, as he always must, on the Bible. When he says that man created a false ideal that he might have knowledge without God, he, according to the footnotes, again, they're really useful, uh, is referring to the verse from Genesis where the serpent tells Eve that if she eats of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she will not surely die but she will be like God. And when Van Til says that man blamed his finite nature rather than his rebellion for his inability to attain knowledge, he is referencing another verse from Genesis when God confronts Adam and Eve about their disobedience. 
and Eve blames the deception of the serpent, and Adam blames Eve, because he's a stand-up guy. It's necessary for the presuppositional argument to work that our finite nature be eliminated as the ultimate cause of our lack of certain knowledge. But it's somewhat impressive that Van Til is able to link it directly to the Bible. Theologians are fucking ninjas when it comes to deriving shit from the Bible. So anyway, that's the doctrine of man. Next up is the doctrine of Christ. And this is important because it's through Christ that God and man are reconciled. Van Til notes that Christ has a dual nature, that he is both fully human and fully divine, and that his divine and human natures are unified but not intermingled. Uh, the dual nature of Christ, again, a very common uh, Christian doctrine, Christian principle, the, the hypostatic union. Uh, Van Til also leads us through a portion of the Westminster Shorter Catechism to explain how Jesus discharges the various offices he is said to occupy, those of prophet, priest, and king. He's a prophet because he reveals the word and the will of God, and because through him man can seek the wisdom that he lost access to after the fall. He's a priest because he offers up himself as a sacrifice to reconcile us to God. And he's a king because he subdues us, rules us, and protects us. And Vento explains that all three of these offices are intertwined. He cannot do one without the others. I find it interesting that Van Til's consideration of Christ's role as priest consists entirely of his sacrifice. Christ's role as a teacher is apparently categorized under the prophet heading. So the only thing he does that's considered priestly, according to Van Til, is to allow himself to be scapegoated on the cross. Maybe back in the day, the primary role of the priest was as the guy who killed the animal they were sacrificing that week. I don't know. Uh, and when they stopped doing that, I guess maybe the priests muscled the prophets out and just took over their jobs because the priests were not going to let God fire them. Fuck that. Anyway, next is the doctrine of salvation. Being a Calvinist, Van Til sees salvation as something that is irresistibly applied to us, not something that we choose for ourselves. He compares it to placing a life-giving potion next to a corpse. The potion is no good unless someone administers it, because as a corpse, you're dead. You can't reach out and take the potion for yourself. Uh, and the life-giving potion of salvation is administered by the Spirit of God. Quote, The only alternative to this would be that man could at some point take the initiative in the matter of his own salvation. This would imply that the salvation wrought by Christ could be frustrated by man. Suppose that none should accept the salvation offered to them. In that case, the whole of Christ's work would be in vain, and the eternal God would be set at naught by temporal man. So, one reason we should assume that salvation is an irresistible work of God and not something humans can choose for themselves is that if it were otherwise, there would be the possibility that Christ's sacrifice would be for nothing. I have a few thoughts about that. First, it doesn't say much for the appeal of Christ's offer of salvation on its own merits, does it? If Van Til worries that no one would voluntarily accept the offer of salvation, no one, ever, for the rest of time, then either God is a poor salesman or the offer itself is shit. Second, if God administers salvation to certain people, the elect, unconditionally, and he does this because otherwise he would risk no one taking the offer of salvation, why not administer salvation to everyone, unconditionally? It would require no more effort from an omnipotent God to save all than it does to save a few. Why have an elected group at all? Why not just save everyone? The fact that he doesn't save everyone when it would clearly be within his power to do so doesn't speak very well for God's compassion or for the value of Christ's sacrifice. Finally, if God made salvation a matter of choice and somehow no one chose to accept the offer, so what? 
Van Til describes it as a matter of God's power, not God's loving desire to spare his creation from suffering. That being the case, why should God care if no one accepted his offer of salvation? The work of salvation couldn't have depleted him in any measure because he is all-powerful and immutable. An all-powerful God surely wouldn't be embarrassed if none of his foolish, ignorant humans decided to take him up on salvation. We, limited humans, should be incapable of embarrassing or frustrating God, so why would he give a shit? Of course, that last one opens up a whole new can of worms since it prompts me to ask why God, the all-powerful, would possess some of the other characteristics attributed to him in the Bible, namely jealousy and anger. One last thing, it strikes me as odd that Van Til brings up the possibility of everyone rejecting God's salvation offer where it made a matter of choice, but he doesn't mention the Calvinist doctrine of total depravity, which would seem to make it a certainty that no one would choose salvation, because total depravity says we would be incapable of making such a choice. I suppose that, he, that what he does say can be read as implying total depravity, but this would have been as good a time as any since he is introducing and summarizing his thought to discuss or at least introduce explicitly this very important Calvinist idea of total depravity, and it just isn't mentioned. Next, there is the doctrine of the church. Van Til defers to the definition of the church contained in the Westminster Confession of Faith, which says that the church consists of the whole body of the elect under the authority of Christ. The selection of the elect and therefore the, the uh, composition of the church is entirely up to God. Quote, It is this fact of God's absoluteness as expressed in his election of men that gives us courage in preaching and in reasoning with men. Sin being what it is, we may be certain that all our preaching and all our reasoning with men will be in vain unless God brings them to bay. This suggests to me one of the most puzzling implications of Calvinism. Why bother with preaching and reasoning at all? If God chooses the elect, and if the elect are chosen unconditionally, what is the point of anything the church does? Why gather together in fellowship? Why preach the gospel? Why go on mission trips? Why bother with apologetics? If predestination is true, nothing you do will make any difference anyway. Those who are elected will have salvation, as well as the repentance, conversion, and faith that precede it, all of which are also irresistibly received from God. And those who were destined to not receive salvation will go to hell, just as they were always meant to. What's the fucking point of any of this? Why defend the faith? Why write books and teach classes on apologetics? It makes no difference. Finally, we come to the last doctrine to be considered in this chapter, the doctrine of last things. This doctrine pertains to God's knowledge about and control of the future. Without the certainty that God has planned the future and that things will work themselves out according to God's plan, Christians could not trust in God's promises. So the doctrine of the last things is very important. Van Til closes the chapter by insisting that even through this very general initial review, he has shown that it is not merely a generic Christianity that apologists must defend, but the Reformed faith. He says he has shown that the doctrine of God cannot be derived from Scripture, cannot be derived apart from Scripture. Excuse me, that's exactly the opposite. He says the doctrine of God cannot be derived apart from Scripture that it contains all the attributes of God, and that it stands in opposition to non-Christian forms of thought. Well, to my reading, he hasn't actually shown any of those things. He's asserted them, and the latter two of those three sound reasonable, assuming you accept his definition of God, but I don't see how he's demonstrated that it's a fact that Christian doctrines cannot be derived apart from the Bible. I know that this is a common principle, sola scriptura, uh, 
And perhaps, as with his earlier description of man's place in the universe, Van Til didn't anticipate that the critics to whom he means to respond here would fight him on this. Nevertheless, he doesn't do anything beyond simply stating that this is true. He says that the doctrine of God can't be derived apart from Scripture, but he doesn't show me why that's true. Well, maybe that's coming, because as you can see, we've got quite a way to go. Well, that is it for chapter one. That is it for this video. In the next video in this series, I will cover the next three chapters in this book, and those would be chapter two, the Christian philosophy of reality, chapter three, the Christian philosophy of knowledge, and chapter four, the Christian philosophy of behavior. A trilogy of Christian philosophy. It sounds exciting, doesn't it? Well, that's it, everybody. Please leave a comment on this video. Uh, agree with me, disagree with me. Tell me what I got right. Tell me what I got wrong. Tell me what you thought was interesting. Tell me what you thought bored the shit out of you. There might, unfortunately, be some of that when we consider this book. I look forward to reading anything you have to say. I thank you for your attention, and I will see you in the next video.